Good morning, good morning, almost good afternoon in a couple more minutes. Uh, this is the Leventhal Math and Education Center. If you're just tuning in, it's a little bit before noon, and so I'm going to chat a little bit uh, before we bring on our guest and we let folks file into our digital auditorium. I'm Garrett Dash Nelson. I am the curator of maps at the Leventhal Center, and it's nice to see you all here today. Um, in our sort of pre-roll tape, as we wait for people to join in, I thought I would share with you a fun little thing that we've been sharing at the Map Center recently, a new digital map that lets you put the Ever Given wherever you want it. Uh, it has been freed from the Suez Channel in real life, which means you can float it around to Boston Harbor, you can wedge it by Boston Air, uh, Logan Airport, uh, stick it wherever you'd like. Uh, this has been a fun little side project for us to explore the power of maps. Uh, you can see it at scale, for instance. That's the real size of the Ever Given if it were to pull up uh, by East Boston uh, towards the airport. Uh, you can put it in your swimming pool. You can put it across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, check, check it out. Uh, it's evergiven-everywhere.glitch.me. All right, it is just about noon time, which means we are going to get started. Uh, welcome, regardless of whether you're on YouTube or Facebook or however you might be tuning in. My name is Garrett Dash Nelson. I am the Curator of Maps and Director of Geographic Scholarship at the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. And today we have a really exciting program, a uh, conversation with Stephen Boucher, the author of the new book, Boston in Transit. Before we begin, I want to stop to acknowledge the complicated and contested threads that are woven throughout historical geography, including difficult stories that we neither can nor should ignore. The place that we now call Boston is the ancestral and current home to indigenous peoples, including Mashpee and Quinnah and Wampanoag tra tribes, the Nipmuc nations, and descendants of the Massachusetts people. Copley Square, where the library is located, sits on top of a filled tidal estuary that once featured some of the most advanced marine agricultural techniques in all of North America. The maps that are in our collections at the Leventhal Center bear witness not only to histories of colonial exploitation, but also to conflicts that range from labor struggles to racial segregation. In some cases, these maps aren't just documents of those stories, but documents that actually played a role in making them happen in the first place. So through all of our programs and interpretation, we encourage visitors to consider how these histories, the ones that are shown in the maps, the ones that are transacted through the maps, still exert real consequences on the present day. Now, today's program is sponsored by the Boston Map Society. Uh, the Boston Map Society is a group of cartographic enthusiasts located not only in Boston, but throughout all of New England. This year, the Boston Map Society's programs are all online and membership is free. So I would encourage you to sign up at bostonmapsociety.org. Um, that gives you access to the society's mailing list and to membership for this free 2021 year. It also gives you access to the Map Society's joint programs sponsored uh, with regional map societies across the United States. And there's quite a few interesting lectures and programs that are coming up in the coming months. So again, bostonmapsociety.org, where you can join for free. I also want to spotlight some of the other upcoming programs at the Leventhal Center. Next month, we'll be running a three-part data empowerment course called Making Sense of Maps and Data. We've actually already reached capacity for that course, uh, but you can sign up to add your name to the wait list in case the seat becomes available or to get notified about the next time we'll be offering the course later this year. We also have two free neighborhood history events that are coming up using our Atlascope tool. Those are Newton by Map on May 10th and Brooklyn by Map, excuse me, Brookline by Map on June 14th, both of them at 7 p.m. All of those events, as well as more than 10,000 digitized maps, information on research in our collections, free educational programs, and digital exploration tools are all available on our website, leventhalmap.org. So I encourage you after the program is over to visit our website and dive into the many resources that are available there. And finally, I wanna note that the Leventhal Center is an independent nonprofit our free programs are supported by donors like you. 
If you like today's program and you want to support work like our uh, programs in K-12 classrooms, our preservation of historic materials, or our efforts to bring modern map making skills to the wider public, consider making a donation at leventhalmap.org slash donate. Even a two or a five dollar donation can go a long way to help advance our free to all mission. Now, I'm joined today by uh, somebody who is perhaps one of the uh, most closely engaged uh, with kind of remixing and reworking our historic collections, Stephen Boucher. Stephen is the author of the really fantastic new book, Boston in Transit, which consists of hundreds of not only maps, but photographs and historical uh, research that document centuries worth of transit history in Boston. Stephen is the proprietor of Ward Maps LLC. Um, it's both a store, a physical store in Cambridge, as well as a wonderful uh, online store for original and reproduced historic maps. He's also the owner of MBTA Gifts, which is the MBTA's official merchandise uh, and souvenir store. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen. He's gonna take us through uh, an introduction to this super new book and what's in it. After that, Steve and I will have a short little conversation, and then we encourage a, a, a kind of lively Q&A with all of you out there online. And if you're tuned in from either YouTube or Facebook, you should be able to put uh, comments into the comments section below the video, and we'll be uh, taking questions for Stephen uh, at about the halfway mark. So thanks again for joining us, and Stephen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome to the program. Awesome, thank you, Garrett, and thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank the Leventhal Center and the Boston Map Society for co-sponsoring this introduction to my new book, Boston in Transit. As Garrett mentioned, I'm Stephen Boucher. I've been a collector and dealer of antique maps and public transit artifacts for nearly two decades. So I created my book, Boston in Transit, because I needed it. Over the last six years of researching and referencing disparate sources and collections, I sought a single, concise book about Boston's nearly four centuries of public transportation history. My need was shared by that of my customers who have requested such a book throughout the years. So I'll quickly introduce my book by walking you through its nine chapters and then I'll be available for questions. So let's start with chapter one. Here I detail the evolution of the town and later city of Boston's earliest public transit modes, the first of which arrived by sea. Within months of being established by Europeans in late 1630, Boston, surrounded by water on all sides, established the Charlestown Ferry. This was our city's first mode of public transit. The route of the ferry is shown on this early map of Boston, uh, showing the city in 1775, right at the time of the revolution. During Boston's first couple of centuries, bridges and an ever improving roads allowed horse-drawn wagons to evolve into public coaches, the taxi cabs of their day. As the industrial revolution kicked off in the early 19th century, public coaches became inadequate to transport a growing populace. So in the 1830s, omnibuses, primitive buses pulled by horses, arrived to replace public coaches on the streets of Boston. Along with the omnibus, steam trains came to the city in the 1830s, providing yet more connections across the water surrounding the city. This 1842 map, about 200 years after the establishment of the city, shows Boston tied to the mainland by two ferry lines, three steam railroad lines, multiple bridges, and a winded Boston neck. Basically, all these connections are now ringing the former Shawmut Peninsula, which is essentially an island when Boston was settled. Chapter one rounds out with the arrival of Boston's first street railways, the horse railroads. By the early 20th century, streetcars had replaced public coaches and omnibuses entirely. With chapter two, I tell the story of how Boston's multiple street railways company, street railway companies were consolidated into one massive concern, the West End Street Railway Company. This 1876 map, uh, which I believe is from the Leventhal Collection, reveals the plethora of steam and horse railroad lines serving Boston and contiguous communities in the decade before the West End consolidation. All of these lines are horse or steam railroads and all of these dots are major stations. Very dense network. Under the West End and its successor, 
the Boston Elevated Railway, there was a proliferation of streetcar technologies, vehicle types, and for the first time, a citywide public transit system operated by one company. Chapter three details, I apologize. I just wanted to point out a couple of the unique, uh, besides regular typical streetcars, there were experiments with double-decker streetcars. The stitching of two streetcars together called an articulated streetcar. This is a wonderful photo of people boarding an articulated streetcar in Harvard Square. So we brought a lot of streetcars to the city. So chapter three, that details the need for construction and opening of the Tremont Street subway. This is the first public transit subway in North America. Boston's was the fourth to be constructed in the world after London, 1877, Budapest, Glasgow, 1896. And precipitating this need for a subway in Boston in the 1890s, the city was clogged with streetcars. This picture on the left here shows a streetcar blockade. This was taken by the city of Boston Transit Commission who built the subway. It was built by the city of Boston. Uh, the city also funded studies such as this really interesting map where they shaded in pink all of the, what they called the most congested area of streetcar and street traffic in the city of Boston. And if you drew a line of where they built the subway, it essentially goes through the middle of that pink area. So our solution, we put the trolleys underground into what became the Tremont Street subway. It's the core of the green line. The subway was, as I mentioned, built by the city and it opened in 1897 and 1898. Uh, this is Boston Transit Commission map shows. This is from the Boston Transit Collection. Uh, the subway started around Causeway Street, ran through Scully Square, Adams Square, along Tremont Street, and then uh, uh, streetcars popped out at Pleasant Street and then over in the Public Garden. They literally popped up in the Public Garden. On to Chapter 4. Um, oh, I apologize. At the end of Chapter 3, um, Chapter 3, I really get into the construction of the subway. Uh, a lot of proven as well as vanguard construction techniques were used. Uh, the project was the big dig of its day. Uh, the streets above were made, as this picture on the right shows, a continuously uh, evolving melee of construction and redirected street traffic. This is the construction site of Park Street Station. As you can see surface streetcars have been redirected. All right, so here we go. You got my screen now? All right, you're back. Sorry, All right, Dave. we're back. Okay, so the subway, trolleys were underground. They're having a great time. So now we're moving on to... Um, uh, uh, steam railroads with chapter four. So I'll start this from uh, scratch here. So with chapter four, our attention turns to the establishment and consolidation of Boston steam railroad companies. By 1855, each of the eight independent railroads serving Boston had its own downtown passenger terminal. These stations are mapped on the left side of this spread and pictured on the right. On the north side, the Boston and Maine Railroad consolidated various railroad companies and their separate Boston depots into Union Station, featured here, and completed in 1893, and then later North Station, completed in 1898. On the south side, the Commonwealth and the City of Boston worked with the New Haven and Boston and Albany Railroads to establish South Station. The Grand Terminal opened with great festivity on New Year's Day in 1899. In this spread from the book, two cadastral real estate maps reveal the site of South Station on the left before and on the right after the terminal's construction. The map on the left reveals a city uh, still facing the ocean with wharfs and ocean facing uses all replaced uh, by the turn of the 20th century with the massive uh, South Station, which at the time had one of the largest train sheds in the entire world. <clears throat> in the 1880s and 1890s, around the same time Union Station and South Station were being considered, the Commonwealth con commissioned studies of transportation improvements for a traffic clogged city, as well as to accommodate future growth. A significant result of these studies was the construction of rapid transit lines. This is the focus of chapter five. After some early experiments, including the MIGS elevated railway, uh, shown here on the left, three major rapid transit lines were constructed. Sorry about that. 
No? The first was the conversion of the East Boston Tunnel streetcar subway to rapid transit service. The second was the main line elevated running from Sullivan Square to Charlestown to Nubian Square and Roxbury. And this will all become the MBTA's orange line on um, this uh, hopefully not blank page, but there's a beautiful two page spread of Sullivan Square Terminal, which opened in 1901. And this that anchored the northern end of the line. I'm going to uh, reset that PDF, see if I can get that to load properly. Yeah. Stephen, while you're while you're resetting your PDF, I'll just note yep. that of, of course all of these images are available in the book itself. Um, the book is part of our uh, research collections at the Leventhal Map and Education Center. So as soon as we're back open, you can of course come and see all these pictures in the really beautifully produced uh, physical volume uh, in our learning center when you have a chance. All right, we love it when the tech works and when it doesn't. There we go, we got a book. Sorry folks, appreciate you bearing with us. It's probably just such a beautiful image that the computer That's is right. uh, hesitant to, to load it so, up. So much high resolution imagery. Okay, so, so station, rapid transit. So, we're t so we're basically we're talking about the roots of the uh, current day orange line, blue line, and red line. Great. So this is the two page spread I was talking about with Sullivan Square Station. This was almost bigger than major transit uh, hubs and railroad stations you could could have found in Europe. And this was in Charlestown. So the third rapid transit line after uh, the main line elevated in East Boston Tunnel conversion to rapid transit was the Cambridge Dorchester line the first segment of which opened between Harvard Square and Park Street Under, shown on the left in 1912. When it opened, the Cambridge subway featured the largest rapid transit cars then in operation. These are shown on the right. These are essentially the first red line cars. With chapter six, transit map cartography takes center stage. During the 1890s and into the 20th century, for mere nickels and dimes, Portable transit maps became widely available at newsstands. A common example shown on the left of this side of the spread was George Walker's vest pocket map of Boston. It folded into these nifty little covers shown on the right. You put it in your vest pocket map and you could navigate the city. A supreme pocket sized public transit map was Richard Lufkin's system route map, first issued by the Boston Elevated Railway Company in 1936. The branded covers of all editions of the system route map are feature, featured on the left side of this spread. Editions of Lufkin's map were issued initially by the Boston Elevated, then the MTA, and later a young MBTA. An interesting pair of maps appears in a 1926 report completed by the Commonwealth's Division of Metropolitan Planning. Among intriguing and unbuilt improvements, these two maps shown here, proposed the combination of the East Boston Tunnel and the Tremont Boylston Street subways into a single rapid transit subway, running all the way from East Boston all the way to Bright. Of course, this was never completed. In chapter seven, our focus turns to, from rail to transportation to rubber tire transit vehicles, the bus and the trackless trolley. The Boston Elevated Railway Company, overseer of Boston's transit system from the 1890s to 1947, operated its first public transit bus and trackless trolley in 1922 and 1936, respectively. As shown in this 1925 map, the Boston Elevated's nascent bus network consisted of a handful of disparate routes. Each of these little lines is a bus route. Over time, these buses replaced many of the streetcar lines entirely. Chapter seven charts not only the con consolidation of Eastern Massachusetts's street railway networks into that of the MBTA, but also the evolution of those networks from all streetcar to all bus systems. As shown in this two page spread in the 1930s, the Eastern Massachusetts Street Railway Company, which was pur purchased by the T in the 1960s, marketed its streetcar and bus network with these awesomely colorful guides and really interestingly designed maps. 
So chapter eight, this deals with the 17 year arc of the Metropolitan Transit Authority, predecessor of the T. The MTA put Boston's bus, trackless trolley, streetcar, and rapid transit lines under 100% public control for the first time. The, term, the tenure of the MTA was marked by earnest efforts, earnest efforts to expand and improve the legacy network of the Boston Elevator. The MTA expanded and renovated lines to woo a public that was increasingly turning towards private automobiles and subsidized roadways to commute. Among Im improvements brought to the Boston by the MTA, as detailed on this spread, were new Bluebird rapid transit cars for what is now the red line. The MTA fought the good fight, but in the end, it could not overcome increasing suburbanization, rising costs, and limits of its service area. So chapter nine, the final chapter in the book, is really a book in itself. This is a history of the MBTA from 1964 to 2019. Here I delve into what the MBTA brought to Boston, including massive improvements, I'm sorry, massive improvement projects funded through an adaptability to tap federal funds, progressive actions that save both the regional public bus and commuter rail networks from abandonment, and the establishment of an identity for public transportation that remains integral to that of Boston, the T. I thought this was a nice bookend because the uh, first annual report of the T is a, a map of Boston at the nearly at the time of its European settlement uh, overlaid with a 1966 uh, logo of the T. The first decades of the MBTA's tenure were described as a fresh start by the T. It epitomized by its commissioning of the manual a guide of guidelines and standards. Created as, by design firm Cambridge 7, the guidelines gave us, as revealed in this two-page spread, and some of these things have never been published, the MBTA's T logo, the T's iconic rapid transit or spider map, as well as a detailed roadmap that informed decades of station re renovations, along with everything aesthetic for the MBTA. In chapter nine, I break down all of the MBTA's cap major capital projects and major purchases from early station renovations, including Arlington Station, shown here, which was the first entirely to be rebranded per the Manual of Guidelines and Standards. I also get into the plethora of fleets of transit vehicles brought to the streets and rails of Boston. As infrastructure is a major focus of my book, chapter nine details the planning, construction, and opening of the T's major line extensions and re reconstructions. These include the South Shore and Northwest extensions of the Red Line, the latter of which is shown on this spread, the Haymarket North extension of the Orange Line, the replacement of the Washington Street Elevated, initially with the Southwest Corridor of the Orange Line and later the Silver Line, and the restoration of commuter rail service on the old colony lines. So I'll wrap this up this introduction to my book with a map. I produced this to accompany Boston in transit. This map, charts the history of the T's current network of colored lines. Line and station names and dates, along with all openings, changes, and closings are all mapped. It's a quick reference guide in map form. On my bostonintransit.com website, I have fine art prints available of this map, of course, the book, and also, as Garrett mentioned, many of the maps and images and photographs of the book, uh, many of which have never been digitized before, um, I do offer for uh, purchase. Um, with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you so very much for listening. Sorry about the technical difficulties, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Stephen. That was excellent. And even uh, having had a chance to page through the um, the book itself, uh, it's really nice to, to hear you give us a big, broad overview of it. I have a couple of questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Again, as a reminder, if you're tuned in either on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can drop a question for Stephen in the comments thread, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can on the broadcast. So Stephen, maybe you can take us uh, a little bit behind the scenes in terms of the research process to make this book. I mean, there are how many hundred, several hundred maps <laughs> and images um, we know, of course, some of them came from the Leventhal and the BPL collections. Um, mm -hmm. Where did you look? Where did you begin? Um, were there any surprising collections that were useful to you? Things that you knew existed, but that you had to really dig for? Um, what, what kind of work goes into creating something of this volume? 
So over the course of the, the six year process of this, where it, it was a uh, it became a serious project, I started with what I had on hand. Uh, I had been um, collecting and dealing in ar ephemera artifacts, station signs. Um, you see some of the things I've been collecting over the years behind me. Um, that was the core of my business uh, for uh, my ward map shop. But as I collected more and got deeper into collections, um, an entire estate sometimes would come to me. I needed to teach myself what I was dealing in. And I could go to resources, books, uh, things that were written, articles. Um, and then as I started to assemble it, I realized I want this would become the core of the book, the visual information. Uh, and then I needed to branch out and fill in uh, sometimes significant gaps of where my personal collection uh, lacked. And, um, you know, there are some wonderful local repositories. I mean, everywhere from uh, the PBD Essex, um, their library, uh, Historic New England, of course, the BPL. Um, and then there's also a lot of generous private collectors who shared photographs with me, shared their insight. Um, and oftentimes they could share a direct um, experience with the artifact, the map, the ticket. They could tell me about how they used it. Um, so there's the traditional uh, route of going to archives uh, and mining, and but there's also this, uh, there's a wonderful um, background of uh, collectors and dealers that uh, I've developed, developed relationship, relationships over the years that contributed to the final product. Any uh, items, uh, historical documents that surprised you that you never knew existed? I mean, you obviously have an encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, of this field already. Um, in your years as a, as a dealer of maps. But uh, anything that you came across in, in pulling together this book where you kind of thought, wow, I, I, I never knew there was a map of this or I never knew there was a photograph of this? So many things. Um, one of the things I think it's when you know something exists and then you search for it, I find those were the surprise that you found one or two. Um, for example, you know, we take for granted today that there's a T map in every station or there should be, right? Um, Back in the day, let's say the elevated is running. This is right around 1901. You got the L's running through Boston. Just to find a photograph of a map um, posted in a station was a challenge. When I found one or two with the help of some uh, uh, other dealers uh, to find an actual example of it, I've only found two. One's behind me <laughs> and one is in your collection. Um, so it's things like that that, are, you know, there's an excitement to find the artifact, but then digitize it, share it, put it in the book, tell people what it is, put it in context. Um, and then there's there's just wonderful things where, you know, if I'm in an antique store in New York State or wherever it was while I was doing research and I came across something that was pertinent to Boston, those are just wonderful finds. I mean, I am a picker at heart. So a lot of uh, the artifacts come out of that love of, of picking for, for history's sake. I, if I can ask you one more question, then we'll turn it over to the audience. Steve, I'm really curious, um, if you can speculate a little bit on how are people's relationships with transit maps changing now that we have these kind of ephemeral, instantly produced transit directions on everybody's phones. You talk about how embedded mapping is into the infrastructure of a transit system, whether it's these pocket maps from the turn of the century or the kind of high modern color maps from the 1960s. You know, they, they kind of they, their visual representation of what mm -hmm. the system is for for its riders, for its engineers, uh, for its planners. I suspect that in addition to using those kind of classic printed maps, many people get around the T now by, you know, asking Google Maps or Apple Maps or some transit app to say, you know, what station should I get on at? Where do I transfer? And then where do I get off without maybe even knowing what, what stops are in between? Um, how, what, how, how do you think that will change um, our kind of like uh, popular cartographic understanding of, of, you know, where transit lines go and how a city's transit line is, transit system is embedded into the urban landscape? I think something to think about that uh, when it comes, no matter when it's mapped, whether it was line maps. I mean, the first maps, some of the first earliest uh, horse railroad maps I found in Boston were just a, a pair of lines representing a street and then they would write the streets next to it. Now you can Google map and you have not only the transit system, you have the times, you have the physical locations of the trains, APIs allow you to chart it. Regardless of how you're mapping or how you're engaging with the map of the transit system, the hands of the editor is vital 
is the map useful because it was edited well and presented well? And that is the same for a printed paper map, which is actually a lot more challenging to edit because you're going down to two dimensions. But it's also something like, a, let's say, a, a Google map or, or a, um, somebody um, creates one using the, the API data from the T. The hands of the editor will make that map useful, engaging, and um, or non-useful, and, and, and you know we won't see it again. Um, but the, the 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 purpose is the same. Look at the information. Get where you you got to get from point A to point B. But I really think the hands of the editor and and uh, is vital to a, a useful and um, long-lasting map, regardless of technology. Yeah, if I can plug our current digital exhibition, Bending Lines, um, one of the topics we, we look at is that, that uh, the way that GIS and data and computer maps are as much shaped by human hands and decisions by human cartographers and data modelers at just in the same way that you know more traditional paper maps are as well. Um, I'm going to take some comments. Uh, again, uh, if you have a question for Stephen, uh, feel free to drop in the comments. We'll try to get to as many we, as we can in the next half hour. And then I know um, Stephen is more than happy to follow up with any of the ones that we don't mm -hmm. get. So we'll start here saying, Stephen, can you comment on the extent to which the historical development and ultimate consolidation of Boston's mass transit system mirror that of other major American cities? So. We're lucky. Um, a lot of other ma major American cities, mid 20th century, when a lot of the railed systems, okay, so commuter rail, uh, long distance and short distance passenger, and as well as streetcar systems, a lot of municipalities, regions, states were given a choice. Step up, buy it, fund it with public dollars, or let it disappear potentially forever. We're one of the cities that stepped up. We, we used a lot of federal funds for it. We also tapped state funds for it. Um, but there are cities where they had systems that were, um, I'm thinking of uh, just, uh, I think it was um, uh, Atlanta. They had the second largest or, or the largest uh, trackless trolley system after Boston's. We still have trackless trolleys. There's not many sy uh, systems in the country that have them. So. It really was political will and um, inertia of a populace. There are still still cities now that they want to build transit systems, but there's political push to, oh, no, 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 we can't have that. Um, so we were lucky. Um, so it, it wasn't as simple as all the trains disappeared and um, then they were built back. Some places they never disappeared. And thankfully, um, an early MBTA had the foresight and uh, the funding mechanisms to buy the commuter rail networks eventually, buy the street, uh, the bus networks that were failing. Um, yeah. Question from Nikhil. Uh, love the picture of what Sullivan once was. Do you have a favorite historic station that has since been demolished? I have. I, I think you nailed it. I mean, that, that station makes me giddy. Um, it has a a, a two and a half story train hall. I mean, I've been in train stations throughout Europe that are from the 19th century that don't hold a candle to that. Um, South Station, I would have loved to have seen that huge train shed, but the trains were out under the shed. But at Sullivan Station, which was was not too big, you could, there were, uh, is it 10 streetcar tracks and one rapid transit track. So imagine in 1901, let's say, you, you run, you ride in on the uh, rapid transit train and you, doors open on both sides. You could get on, then cross the platform, get onto a trolley going to Medford or a trolley going to Somerville. Down below was an entire carousel-like uh, situation where streetcars just went in a circle around a waiting room tiled in um, white uh, glossy tile. So you'd sit in this waiting room with your parasol or your top hat and you'd pick your streetcar. I mean, on so many levels, that station is just elegant, beautiful, but really functional. Dennis has a question. Could you talk about the difference between a streetcar tunnel like Tremont or East Boston and a subway tunnel like Washington Street or Cambridge? I've mm -hmm. read that the East Boston tunnel was converted from a streetcar to a subway tunnel in the 1920s. Yep. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so the nomenclature that I use in my book and I tend to use when I talk about it, um, Typically, Boston referred to 
tunnels for rapid transit cars. So things that we now associate the orange line, the uh, red line. So large um, capacity uh, limited station stop vehicles. They would then use the word subway typically for where the streetcars were running. And that's a, it's a semantic thing. They're all tunnels. They're all subways. Um, let me go back to that question of Reddit. East Boston Tunnel. Yeah, the East Boston Tunnel. So from Maverick Square to uh, Bowden, I'm sorry, to Court Street Station, that was its initial terminus. When that opened, streetcars came from uh, uh, East Boston and ran downtown. It was so crowded that they had to convert it to rapid transit. And when they did that, they extended it to Bowden and Court Street. Uh, they uh, basically destroyed and uh, uh, opened uh, uh, Scully Square under. There is a top portion of Court Street Station still exists. It's it's full of fans that ventilate the T. Uh, I've been in that space with permission of the T. Um, it's just fascinating to see little little bits of the history are still around. The Mass Historical Society writes in to say, why doesn't Boston have a transit museum like the London Transport Museum? Maybe if, offering if, up some space at the Mass Historical Society. For <laughs> I, if, if that's one of my dreams, if I win the lottery. I mean, there, there's so many artifacts. There's so many collections. Um, I don't think we've ever had the, the, the you know, a, a publicly funded um, option that, that someone wants to put it together. But hey, if somebody has the funds, um, I would love to do that. I think that would be, and we have a rich transit history. You go to London, you go to New York, you go to Brooklyn, the trans, I mean, you, you go to Switzerland, you got the, the transit museums are wonderful places to learn about history, trains, infrastructure. And, and you really not just look at the old stuff, but you really uh, share with people it, it, how important it is and how important it is to maintain it and how important it is to keep it going. Um, oh, but I'd love to, you know, whoever wins the lottery, reach out, let me know, we'll put something together. I should say too, another thing that Boston does not have that London does, does have is a museum dedicated to the history of the city itself. Um, mm -hmm. So our friends at the Mass Historical Society, of course, do excellent work on the state at large. Um, the Boston Public Library and the Leventhal Center do programs that are focused on the city. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do is to gather folks from, you know, a number of different historical, cultural sector uh, organizations to talk about topics that are kind of bound together by geography uh, to create um, resources on the history of the city itself. Uh, another question about Sullivan. Why was the Sullivan station demolished instead of being retained when the Orange Line was extended to Malden? So this a lot of the new lines, I'll call them this, when um, the MBTA was uh, creating them, um, they were federally funded. And it was frankly simpler to build a new line and a new station. Uh, it was clear uh, to tap the federal funding. And there was, so th there's a funding aspect. Another aspect is the city uh, wanted to, and, and the T, wanted to remove the elevators, uh, the elevator railways. So Sullivan Square Terminal that was connected to North Station by the Charlestown Elevated. Um, they were unsightly, they were loud, uh, they were you know, a fascinating way to ride through the city at, at two, three stories in the air, but they really were a nightmare if you lived right next to them. Um, they were also extremely hard to take care of. They, they would rust, they were built of rivets and steel. Um, so when the Orange Line was rebuilt, um, over onto the uh, Boston and Maine Railroad uh, right of way over by uh, Community College. Uh, they took the L down, they took Sullivan Square Station down with it. Um, it really just couldn't be used for modern transit uh, and it was antiquated. And if you look at the decades of the, the MBTA, there's a long history of not so much repairing things sometimes, but replacing them in whole. All right. Another question. If you had to pick one, what would you say was the pivotal moment or choice that led to the MBTA that we have today? The MBTA that we have today. Well, the MBTA that we have today is not the one that was created in 1964. Um, I think the that we have today, oof, there's so many. I think what's important to note is there's lots of pivotal moments. There's missed opportunities and then there's opportunities that are seized. And when there's political will and funding and public support, 
great things get done. You know, you can you build new lines, you you get new vehicles, uh, you fund the stations, you, you actually have trains that can run on schedule. And then you have these pivotal moments, which I, I would call miss, the missed opportunities, where um, there's a lack of political will, a lack, a lack of funding. Um, the vehicles get too old, but they're not replaced. Um, yeah, it's the tea is so rich in its ups and downs and its left and right. So uh, I apologize it didn't come up with one single one, but um, yeah, it's more of a pattern. Let's hope that in a hundred years from now, if the answer to that will not be the COVID pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't know. My my book wraps up right before the COVID pandemic. That's yeah. Uh, you were talking a bit about Scully Square a few questions back, but Jay asks, do you know anything about Adams Square and other lost stations under the old Scully Square? Yeah. So Adams Square was a uh, separate station, uh, and it, it, it was basically when they built the Tremont Street subway, uh, it, it had two, uh, it went from Boris. So imagine if we go from Boylston Street Station to Park Street Station to, we now go to Dor down, um, um, down, down, I'm sorry, Government Center. <laughs> um, well, the, the track used to split. Uh, northbound trains would go through Adams Square, and only the southbound uh, streetcars would come through uh, what was then uh, Scully Square. Uh, when Adams Square was removed, now all the trains uh, go through um, uh, Scully under. Uh, Adams Square Station, uh, there, I'm trying to think. I'm pretty sure most of it's gone. I think there's a little piece of it left, um, but uh, it was a wonderful little station. It had a, a, a two and a, a one, one and a half story headhouse on it with a big clock. So if you're running towards North Station or the, uh, you could uh, see, see the clock for your train. Um, it was a beautiful little station. It was also a place where uh, they had intended streetcars from the northern suburbs would come into the city and turn around in a little loop. Um, historians debate whether it was really used that well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's gone in a sense. Andy writes to say, I like the subway transit card on the subway of the orange line. Uh, is it, uh, the orange line is moving card uh, from May 1987. Can you say something about this transit card if possible? On the trans, I, I, so are you talking about the map? I assume. Maybe guessing maybe they mean the oh the, transit okay the, that's a, the that's border was was moved yes that's a page in the book yeah that car card was saved uh by a, one of the collectors and dealers um like i said that there's stuff that is in private hands that is wonderful so that car card was installed in orange line cars uh, to, to let people know we're going to be uh the orange line will be coming off the l and then it will be going down into the trench, which is the Southwest Corridor. Um, it's a wonderful graphic in the book and it shows a train going on the L and it shows a train uh, going down below. Um, and it's it's a really way to visually communicate. It almost, you almost don't even need the text on it. And the, the MBTA it was, you know, really a visual pioneer in the, in the mid century for sure. Uh, I think that's one of the, but certainly, I, speaking for myself, um, one of the things that's always drawn me to MBTA maps is, you know, they really are, you know, they had a, had and and have, um, to a certain extent, a, a pretty impressive uh, visual sensibility about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, and I was going to say, we got We got to thank Cambridge Seven Architects here in Cambridge. Uh, you know, they worked with the T, um, but... You know, the Chemirov brothers, um, their uh, rethinking of all the aesthetics of the T um, gave us, you know, the, the visuals that we know today. Um, I'm just looking at the questions too, Garrett. Is it possible that I can answer one here? Sure. I just pulled one up. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, Yep. Uh, Let's do that first. After that. Um, that uh, so again, uh, putting your historian hat on, uh, when do you think Boston was most navigable? We have periods with a dense streetcar network, but congestion and transfers were an issue. Today we have the T, trains, cars, and walking. Was there ever a golden age? Ironically, I would say perhaps during World War II. Um, with gas rationing and material rationing, more people turn to railed transportation, long distance trains, short distance trains, streetcar networks. It was a golden age for railed transit. Um, and you really could get anywhere. Um, and a lot of cars were off the street because of uh, rationing. So the traffic flowed better, streetcars moved better. 
Um, I think that's a golden age. Um, being during a war is, is, is not the reason. <laughs> Uh, and then I, I saw a quick question. Somebody asked, why did the name change from the MTA to the MBTA? Uh, so the MTA, uh, which was created by the Commonwealth, um, they needed to make a bigger, geographically larger and more uh, substantially uh, politically powerful uh, authority. So they created the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. They're two different entities, uh, but they basically rolled the MTA into the MBTA. Uh, so that's the name change. Great. Um, let's see. Can you talk about any early plans for the North-South Rail Link? Oh, there are plans on that I've seen at least going back to the 20s. Um, it's always been uh, a very extremely and supremely logical idea that you could run a train uh, from the northern terminuses, uh, which congealed into North Station, and the southern terminuses, which congealed into South Station. Uh, we still don't have that direct link. Um, an intriguing one, which uh, I think this is in the 1926 Commonwealth uh, Report for Improvements, was to actually put the trains at a South Station, put them up on an elevated Atlantic, Atlantic Avenue, and then bring them back down at North Station. That became the Atlantic Avenue elevated, which was a rapid transit line. Uh, there was also a version of that as a highway. Um, that link has seen countless iterations uh, throughout the 20th and e even to the 21st century. Um, yeah. Something that we always uh, kind of mention when we're looking at historical maps at the, at the Leventhal Center is that, you know, we are still living in the, in the city that was built in the past, right? And so decisions about everything from where those terminal stations were located, you know, in the 19th century to the length of cars, uh, you know, when tunnels were built or where um, certain pieces of heavy infrastructure were built still has huge consequences for how we get around today, right? And what it is possible and not possible to do um, in terms of shaping not only transit, but housing, access to jobs, um, mm -hmm. all, all of those kinds of questions are not merely coincidentally related to this history, but are, you know, we're still like <laughs> kind of carved into the, the, the city that we live in today. Uh, let's see here. Um, just trying to scroll through all of these great questions. Again, if we don't get to all of your questions, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Um, if we don't get to all of your questions, I know that Stephen um, is available via his website. Um, um, I'm sure he'd love to hear other questions there as well. Uh, okay, where are we? Let's see. I'm just, I'm going through the, the... How about a question about mascots? Were there ever any other mascots for the T, like my man, Charlie? Um, Charlie on the MT oh. memorialized in the uh, infamous Charlie card. Do other systems have similar things? In Japan, <laughs> if you've ever been to, in, in Japan, everything has a mascot. Every train, every tro every every system there, and they're great. Um, they even have little mascots on the doors. Um, so you know, it's like instead of it saying "Beware of the closing doors, please," there's a little picture of the mascot saying that. So yeah, there are systems that have mascots. Uh, I don't believe it's very common in the United States. Charlie came out of what um, the '90s and early aughts when they were establishing the Charlie card, and they they wanted to come up with a whole branding uh, campaign. Um, I was asked to wear the the Charlie costume once. I I, I politely declined. Um, you know, it, they were trying to have fun, um, and you know, it ironically goes back to a story of a guy who couldn't get out of the tea because he didn't have exit fare. So. Um, yeah, so, you know, the T was, the T, you know, at least, you know, I've worked with the T for a while through the MBTA gifts and, you know, they're not afraid to make, you know, to poke fun at themselves and, and not take things too seriously sometimes, um, you know, but there's a lot of hardworking people there. Um, and uh, yeah, Charlie, yeah, there's been no other mascots I can think of. The Cambridge Seven didn't have a mascot in their guidelines of standards in 1966. Uh, question about a famous missing piece of the map. Uh, any working plans to finally connect the red and blue lines? The last I have read is the study that was, I believe, pegged at something like a billion dollars. Um, a few years ago, they were going to use a tunnel boring machine and do a deep tunnel. I think that was shelled because, I mean, frankly, you could just do a cut and cover tunnel. Um, half of the tunnel is already there because the uh, 
streetcar, I'm sorry, the blue line used to come out onto Cambridge Street so that they could take the uh, streetcar, uh, they could take the rapid transit cars over the uh, Longfellow Bridge to get them serviced in Cambridge. Um, so there's half a tunnel there. Um, I, I think, you know, it could be pared down. But the last I heard is it was shelved due to that massive budget estimate. Uh, getting back to sources of historical evidence, the numerous train stations that have disappeared would make an entire book. Are there many photos in existence of the interior of these stations? And if I can maybe editorialize on the end of Jim's question, Stephen, where, you know, if, if, if people get, uh, you know, get to the end of your book and having looked at those hundreds of photographs and maps, um, what are some other resources? Where can people find photographs, maps, either online or at in-person archives. Yep, absolutely. Um, uh, from my perspective, I'm creating bostonintransit.com. I'm slowly adding the thousands of photographs, maps, pieces of ephemera that I have that weren't able to make it into the book. So over time, they'll all be there. In the meantime, uh, I know the Boston Public Library's print collection has a lot. Uh, one of my favorites, and they're wonderful people to work with, are the Boston City Archives. Check out their Flickr page. Um, I'm actually, I, I worked with them some years ago to uh, license those images, so you'll see them on bostontransit.com as well. I'm going to do a really uh, interesting job of cataloging them. So say you want to see all the Adams Square photos, you can go to my website, you'll be able to see them. But in the meantime, there's just a, a vast trove of them, uh, the Boston City Archives uh, site. Um, my goal, there's a few more books coming. Um, this was the big one. Uh, there's going to be uh, one of my ones I'm working on is going to be a before and after uh, showing stations and locations. So you'll be able to see where a station was if it's not there anymore, what it looks like now. But um, that's a few years down the road. Um, but yeah, or, or email me. Um, so uh, info at wardmaps.com is my email. Again, I'm Stephen Boche. That'll come to me. Any questions you have, I'm happy to show you collections. I can take things out of my collection, share them with you. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm always available as a resource. I'll just also add for those who aren't familiar with the Digital Commonwealth portal, um, Digital Commonwealth is a federation of uh, digital libraries across the state of Massachusetts. It's based at the BPL, um, but if you're in Digital Commonwealth, you can search not only the Leventhal Center's collections, uh, you can search the BPL's print collections, you can search the City of Boston archives, you can search Historic New England. Um, if there's a single one-stop shop um, for digitized resources on the history of Boston and Massachusetts, now the Digital Commonwealth is as close as you can come to that. Yeah, so. that's the best place to start. Absolutely. Great. Well, I think we are just about to the top of the hour. Um, so I just want to close with a couple of notes. Um, one is that we have a uh, feedback form for, uh, we'd love to get your input on how this went, um, what programs you'd like to see in the future, uh, what kind of resources that we can bring to you um, digitally as well as in person. Um, before anybody asks, when will you be opening in person? We still don't know. We hope it won't be too much longer, um, but we unfortunately don't yet have a reopening plan. Please take this as a invitation to come see us uh, later this summer or fall whenever we are able to open our doors. Again, the Leventhal Map and Education Center is located in the Central Library in Copley Square. We are free to all, uh, both Boston residents, Massachusetts residents, and everybody. Um, I'm going to paste right now into the comments the uh, 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 feedback form. I hope this is not what, what caused our, us to crash earlier, so hopefully you'll get that link there. Um, it uh, will take you one, one or two minutes to fill out this form. And as a last closing note, again, leventhalmap.org is a, uh, the place to go for future events on maps, and historical geography, and education, digital resources about uh, maps and other information of the city of Boston, as well as our learning and research opportunities. So please join me in thanking Stephen for joining us today. Um, make sure you get a chance to check out bostonintransit.com for more images uh, from the book. Or um, Stephen, can you tell us uh, more about the plans uh, if somebody would like to buy the book? Uh, yes, uh, so it's available on bostonintransit.com. It's around $55. 
Um, it ships from Cambridge. It was actually 100% produced in Massachusetts. Uh, it was uh, printed in Lowell. Uh, so I'm very proud that it was uh, made in Massachusetts, so to speak. Uh, but you can also get it on mbtagifts.com and my uh, core website, wardmaps.com. Um, I appreciate uh, everyone taking the time to ask questions and uh, listen to me introduce the book. Um, of course, if uh, some books get sold, I'll be very grateful. Great. Thanks, Stephen. And thanks again to our friends at the Boston Map Society for co-sponsoring the event. And uh, we'll see you all at our next digital broadcast. Thanks for tuning in.